thanks again for joining us today. Um, this will be the second session of uh, tracheostomies. In the initial one, a couple of months ago, we talked about um, the procedure itself, and as well, we reviewed the candidacy and some data regarding COVID and tracheostomy. This time, I think um, it's more oriented into um, how we can help each other in terms of management and complications. Um, so the goal for this talk will be, one, first identify key aspects of management of tracheostomies. I have a lot of slides, some videos as well. And as well to know, to be aware of uh, some intra-procedural and post-procedural complications um, in tracheostomies. So why as a pulmonary and critical care, although the majority of us don't place tracheostomies, why is it important to know about tracheostomies? It's because as you can see, um, just um, in the last two decades, the number of tracheostomies, especially in the ICU, have increased exponentially, um, almost reaching up to above 100,000, right, in the last year. And if you see also tracheostomies were located here in Michigan, so around 20% of our patients are going to be, at least in the ICU, at some point requiring um, a tracheostomy. Um, just add that to um, during the COVID pandemic, we have even a more uh, higher increase of 25,000 additional tracheostomies um, per year just during the COVID pandemic. And we all know that this is just to stay here. Um, the majority or the main indication for um, tracheostomy in the ICU is uh, chronic respiratory failure or inability to win. However, there are other indications outside in the ICU, and these are important to review. The first one is upper airway obstruction, usually secondary to malignancy, infections uh, like uh, laryngitis, some immuno or immune disease, such, for example, uh, GPA, tracheal stenosis, specifically subglottic, or bilateral vocal cord vocal fold immobility as well. If the patient has also, although this is a little bit more rare, if the patient has chronic aspiration, that's also an indication for tracheostomy. Those are usually placed by ENT, not by us. And or for example, um, if the patient has a lower tracheal pathology re requiring or supporting um, that requires support or bypass with the tracheostomy. Um, a tracheostomy can also be placed for that. If the patient has chronic respiratory failure, this is quite common, for, ex for example, in patients with ALS, and you can see them also every single day in the ABC clinic led by Dr. Choi and our other colleagues. Or, in, and this is extremely rare, especially quite common in the 1980s in the Bronx where um, tracheostomy used to be placed um, for the management of obstructive sleep apnea. Here you can see, as Dr. Ivanko always says, if you didn't take a picture of it, it didn't exist. This is a malignancy just below the subglottic area or tracheal stenosis. There are, these are, for example, quite common indications for tracheostomy or um, at least involvement of our colleagues of ENT or thoracic surgery or ourselves. Um, just to briefly review again, um, this is how an upper surgical tracheostomy is done. Um, is a real incision with uh, dissection of the thyroid uh, gland and actually the um, opening of a window or the creation of a window within the, the one of the tracheal rings. So you can see here, it's actually a hole that they're creating. This is quite different compared to a percutaneous tracheostomy, which is mainly just dilation. So the important thing here is that with a surgical tracheostomy, yes, you can control um, bleeding, but also the stoma, and this is fundamental, the stoma is better, it's gonna be better formed, better formalized, as we say in the lingo. Um, let's review a little bit of the basics of the tracheostomy tube nomenclature. Um, you're going to see several numbers. Usually, we use number eight or six, and this number eight or six are basically based on the Jackson size, which is a very old nomenclature. And then you're going to what you really need to pay attention if it is if it, if it is if the tracheostomy is cough or coughless, right? Another basic principle as well is that the length um, is of the tracheostomy is a standard. 
So that's not going to change unless that is a customized tracheostomy. And the length is proportional to the diameter. Okay, we'll review that in a minute with pictures and slides. And the majority of tracheostomies have dual cannula system, meaning that inside, despite the lumen of the tracheostomy itself, some of them have re uh, reusable inner cannulas, or some other are um, just disposable. So, and this is important because in some cases, these inner cannulas are going to serve as a tool to connect the patient to the ventilator if required. And also, of course, um, helps to avoid the, plug, the clogging um, of the tracheostomy itself. You have to become very familiar. So whatever you practice, um, you have to know that, for example, at the VA, we have commonly portex tracheostomies, which are a little bit different, right? Here at the University of Michigan, we have the Shiley. We have also the Jackson Metallic, and these are quite common in patients with uh, laryngectomies. And also there are Shiley cufflets. We all have all these tracheostomies. The most commonly used are Shiley cuff, right? Uh, at other institutions, you'll have the Portex. I remember this when I was a fellow in Boston. Um, we used to have, mo mo we used to just place Portex. And um, you will see, don't be surprised that patients with laryngectomy uh, will have the Jackson metallic, which are, of course, as you can see here, cuffless. So I prepared this very nice um, device, and you can take a screenshot or I can share that with, this with you as well. And if you want, I think it will be important to have it uh, in our um, intermediate care unit, right? Where you can see the standard cough tracheostomies. You have the Shiley cuff. DIC means disposable inner cannula. You have the Portex cuff DIC as well, which is a little bit different. You have the Shiley cuff SCT, which means single cannula trach. And then you have the extra long tracheostomies. And these actually were quite common to be used during the COVID pandemic because the majority of our patients have a very, um, what we would call anterior neck diameter. Um, and therefore, just a regular tracheostomy will not suffice. Some patients with any kind of edema, very big neck where we have to bypass the soft tissue, we will be using a lot that shyly extended XL, what we call the shiny, the shyly XLT um, P, P for proximal. And as you can see here in the picture, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, the horizontal arm or the, the horizontal limb is actually longer, right? And this is quite beneficial. If the XLT distal, which is the first on the left and the, the first on the left side of the second row here, are usually used for patients who have a tracheal pathology or when you want to bypass, for example, um, an area of malaysia within the trachea, right? So the cuff is uh, um, placed a little bit more distally. You're going to see also the bibonas, and uh, I think last week Dr. Cicluna. Um, handle very well a patient who had a Vibona. These are super flexible. Some of them are customized, some of them not, right? Um, but one of the characteristics of the Vibona tracheostomies is that they're super flexible. And there are some reviews suggesting that uh, the Vibonas are a little bit more associated with um, obstruction. And the reason is because imagine that if this is a posterior wall, the Vibona will be, because it's so flexible, at some point will be hitting the posterior wall of the trachea. Um, then you're going to have the transitional tracheostomies. These serve usually as a bridge, right? You have the cuffless portex, you have the shyly uh, cuffless as well, um, the portex pibona, um, and as well another fenestrated one. And uh, if you review, these are very rare uh, to be used. We prefer, uh, as, as well as our colleagues of ENT, prefer not to use it because it is supposed to benefit with this. Um, opening at the level of the tracheostomy aeration or um, vocalization once a patient is um, moving into less support. However, um, if you review the literature, um, in some cases, and there are a lot of cases where fenestrated tracheostomies actually are associated with, um, with um, higher degree or a higher risk of development of granulation tissue in the subglottic area, right? Um, so the importance of cuff and cuffless, as you can see here, um, you have a regular, sorry, uh, 
Shiley XLT proximal, where the length of the distance or the distance, the thickness of the anterior walls of tissue area is higher, right? You're able to um, have the balloon within the trachea, within the airway. If you put a, a regular tracheostomy in these cases, the cuff will be located in the, in the, either in the lumen or, and you will have a lot of leak, right? And you will not be able to ventilate the patient as well. Um, the Shiley distal, um, the XLT distal here, as you can see, the, <clears throat> the cuff is located a little bit more distal than the regular tracheostomies. And again, this is quite helpful to bypass either a malignancy, a tumor, a stenosis, or area of malacia that are usually produced uh, because hyperinflation of the cuffs. When a cuff, <clears throat> when a cuff is in a tracheostomy is needed, so usually is, um, is to improve the efficiency of um, any kind of positive pressure ventilation. So uh, usually you need a cuff um, tracheostomy to uh, provide non-invasive ventilation, oh, sorry, positive pressure ventilation. Also, if you have uh, concerns of the patient might have massive upper airway bleeding, usually you should consider as well in those cases a cuff tracheostomy, right? <laughs> sorry. Um, in terms of, and these are just also the principles of how to care of a new fresh tracheostomy that we will see a lot in the ICU, right? We prefer to have, even though the patient can be off of the vent or not requiring the vent, um, we prefer to have the balloon inflated within the first 24 hours. And why? Because it prevents, to, uh, uh, it prevents the patient of aspirating blood. And we basically have to wait, and this is key, uh, several days, for the tracheostomy tract to formalize, meaning to mature, before changing the tracheostomy for the first time. And as we said, in surgical tracheostomy, this is performed can be performed earlier because again, the trach, the tracheostomy, the stoma itself is uh, better formalized. There is actually a resection of the anterior part of the cartilage of the uh, tracheal ring, while in um, patients with per, who undergo percutaneous dilational tracheostomy we tend to wait a little bit more, usually seven to seven days. And if the patient is to sit, for example, <laughs> there is no need for change of tracheostomy. That actually puts him at risk of um, performing routine tracheostomy changes in patients who are in high um, pressure ventilator settings are actually risky and unnecessary. Usually we tend to wait, right? And also take into account that um, if the patient is too sick and is on pressors, right, uh, there might be some dysfunction in terms of formalizing less perfusion into the area or the wound that you have created, or the stomach that you have created. So the tract might not be well formed because it has been receiving a lot of, um, um, <clears throat> not only, sorry, it has been receiving less perfusion, let's put it that way. Um, however, it's important to mention that all patients who have a tracheostomy should have, ha should have the tracheostomy change before discharge. And this is not only important to ensure that the trach is well formed, but also to, um, to teach the family member how to perform this if required, right? Um, within these um, uh, initial days after the tracheostomy is uh, placed, manipulation of the tracheostomy should be minimized. And this is important, and we rely a lot in our colleagues from the respiratory therapy department, as well as our nurses, making sure, for example, after you place a trach, you, you have seen me, I'm a little bit OCD, and making sure that the tracheostomy is well-centered, is not full with other tubings as well. And um, I usually suture, suture my tracheostomies during the first week to ensure that when the patient is clean, or rotate it um, is not this large, right? And you should always, always, although we try always to avoid always, right? Have a backup tracheostomy um, and one smaller size at bedside. So um, I want you to pay attention and I think that I can, uh, I did this and thanks to uh, Angela Sherman for helping me out. Where uh, we have a couple of events, um, where we used to do blind tracheostomy changes and we found um, a new device, a new kit, which is actually very cheap, but it ensures uh, that tracheostomy changes are 
uh, placed correctly. And we have argued for a long time, and I appreciate also our AD team, including our super APPs, that um, the tracheostomies or allow us to notify us when the tracheostomies need to be changed and perform dosing AD, right? And you're going to see why. Um, this video I can share with you all. It should be available in campus as well. And perfect. So we're going to do an uh, exchange of a tracheostomy, and for that, we're going to be using a Wayman exchange system that has a cook exchange catheter, two rapid fit um, adapters for ventilation, multiple body dilators, and also a blue rhino that can be served to dilate the stomach. First step is actually have the patient on oxygen and be monitored with autocell and also a blood pressure. We suction the whole system first. After that, what you do is remove the inner cannula. You're going to completely deflate the calf, remove the velcro. And the first thing that I have to do is put the cook exchange catheter. If you lose the airway at any moment, you can ventilate here by connecting these adapters to this catheter. <laughs> that you should advance between 10 to 11 centimeters. It's recommended that the tip should not be beyond the carina. After that, since I already have deflated the cup, I will remove the tracheostomy while maintaining the catheter. Very good. And then I already have my tracheostomy, which is a smaller size and also has been lubricated. And with a loading dilator, please notice that there is no gap here. I will advance this using a cell linear technique. Grab the tip here and then advance nicely. And I have not lost the airway at any moment. Basically, I will secure the tracheostomy and I will place also the inner cannula. Remember to have the patient with a trait mask with humidification as well. That's it. These um Using this uh, uh, device, the uh, Wayman, which is available in the MPU as well as in AD, um, has actually ensured that we have not had any events of uh, tracheostomy misplacement. Uh, uh, tracheostomy misplacement, and in some cases, the other benefit of uh, performing the first initial change of tracheostomies in AD is that um, we have a very well uh, knowledgeable and reliable team. But also, if we need to upgrade or perform a bronchoscopy um, in, um, while doing the change, we have that available in AD, right? So, which it cannot be done in, um, on the floors, right? And the resources are better, um, and the personnel is just like super. Um, so, let's talk a little bit of uh, tracheostomy downsides, right? So, in general, and again, this is just a rule of thumb, um, <clears throat> once the patient is um, in the process of being liberated or freed from the ventilator, is preferably to reduce the tracheostomy size. And why? Uh, the first one is because there is going to be less pressure uh, on the trachea and the risk of um, long term sequela, right? So less granulation tissue, less uh, chances of actually developing malaria in the future in the, in the mid trachea. Uh, you're going to have less esophageal compression and improved swallowing because, again, the tracheostomy is going to be a smaller in relationship to the, um, to the trachea and because there is going to be a higher um, uh, space between the tracheostomy itself and the trachea, air can flow um, in larger volumes towards the vocal cords and the patient is going to be able to phonate. So for all these multiple reasons, Yes, we prefer to downsize our patients. However, there has been a change during the COVID pandemic, right? As you know, um, we were all quite um, um, not scared, but cautious uh, in terms of downsizing, but also um, <clears throat> um, the company that produces Shiley released this new tracheostomy Shiley with um, smaller outer diameters, uh, allowing in some cases a patients with uh, patients with tracheostomies um, um, is keeping the need of downsizing and just going directly to uh, a decannulation or um, passing move valves um, directly, right? 
Um, let's talk about the Passimur valve. And again, this is um, a device you can look, if you type Passimur valve in internet, you'll have several videos and there is just a talk about this. I think that I will encourage you to hang out with um, in the ABC clinic, they see a lot of these patients. And basically, um, but just to summarize, the Passimur valve is a tracheostomy, sorry, is a tool that is connected to the tracheostomy and serves as a one-way valve allowing the air to go in, right? But um, it's one-way valve. It will not allow the air to come out through the opening of the tracheostomy, but it will go around allowing the patient to phonate and to speak, right? This also sometimes, and you can talk to um, Rick Ikin and our super artist as well, this can be used in patients who have who are on the ventilator. There are multiple videos in YouTube, again, um, and about passing more valve who can teach you, who can you can learn from. So um, there are common reasons also when the patient cannot use a passing more valve or when the passing more valve um, is, um, let's put it this way, uh, it will not produce, you put a passing more valve and the patient will not be able to phonate, right? And yes, the first reason, that one of the most common reasons is that yeah, the patient is too weak to generate enough pressures, right, of uh, airflow um, towards the vocal cords. So it's just patient is too weak to generate voice, his voice. Um, super important, right? So as I said, the passive valve is one-way valve, and if you have the, the balloon inflated, you're basically obstructing um, the airway of the patient. Passive valve will not allow the air to come out, and also with a balloon inflated, uh, the patient will suffocate and will die, right? So this is a no-no. Always before putting a passive valve, please double, triple check that the balloon is down. If the tracheostomy is too large, right? So um, also it's another condition that it will prevent the patient with a passive valve to phonate because there will not be enough air space between the tracheostomy and the tracheal wall to go around the tracheostomy there will not be enough air to go through the vocal cords and the patient to be able to phonate. Or, and this is important also, and one, why the importance of putting the tracheostomy in the right place. Uh, if you have a tracheostomy place very close or between the cricoid and the first ring of a tracheal ring, um, the, the tracheostomy will be high and will actually block the vocal cords and the patient will not be able to, to speak, right? You also have to um, suspect if the patient, after you have ruled out all these four conditions, right, and if the patient is still not able to uh, phonate, you have to think, is there any obstruction? Is there any granulation tissue in the subglottic area not allowing or um, the patient to ventilate, or there is a intrinsic uh, laryngeal pathology, and you call your colleagues from ENT for that, right? Um, Let's talk a little bit of um, complications now. Um, let's switch a little bit the topic. And I just put this uh, slide because again, compl serious complications in tracheostomy are rare, um, but they can be fa fatal, right? Uh, minor complications are a little bit higher. And why? Is because as you can see, we're very close to, um, we're first, we're dealing with the airway. Uh, that, that's why it can be fatal. Right? And secondly, we're very close to vessels and also a gland, which is very vascular, right? Um, I just put this uh, large study published almost uh, 15, 16 years ago, um, where they were comparing percutaneous trach versus surgical trach in critically ill patients, and just comparing the safety of each one, right? So <clears throat> in the percutaneous, in the percutaneous tracheostomy, there was, um, uh, lower uh, wound infection rates, right? And, and the percutaneous tracheostomy was basically equivalent in terms of bleeding and mortality, right? There were no reported long-term complications. And then just going to be a little bit more granular, there was um, uh, the, one of the, um, when they evaluated wound infection, it was a little bit favorable um, in favor of percutaneous tracheostomies more than I think 15, 17,000 patients um, using this analysis. 
right? Um, in terms of bleeding, um, a little bit in favor of um, percutaneous less bleeding because there is less dissection. But again, there might be a bias um, in terms of patient selection. As you can see, and all our fellows have learned when we do tracheostomies together, we're very careful in reviewing ultrasonographically the patient or examining with the ultrasound, looking for vessels, but also reviewing the CAT scan, right? And when there is a high risk of bleeding, we prefer to have our colleagues of ENT help us with those cases. Uh, in terms of mortality, again, a little bit in favor, but again, uh, not significant. No, there is no clinically significant, um, statistically significant. Um, so in terms of complications of tracheostomy, yeah, you're gonna have, you have to divide that in early and late, right? And the ones that we're uh, always look into, um, there might, actually one of the most common, and we had this happening a lot during the COVID pandemic, is the venous um, bleeding. And that's why, for example, now as routine, we have a cautery, um, cautery available. When we do our percutaneous tracheostomy, we have surgery cell as well. We cauterize really well. The most common one is venous. Uh, arterial is really rare. Um, Pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum, rare, um, but um, we do that as well. I think two weeks ago we have a case of uh, pneumothorax, incidental pneumothorax, although um, um, uh, I think this was not related to the procedure. Uh, this can happen, pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum can occur during the tracheostomies because you're putting needles in the airway, and if you don't have good bronchoscopic visualization, um, the needle can trespass the lateral wall of uh, the trachea and injure the lung. The ones that were very, they are very scary, and we all are um, have to be prepared to handle is accidental decannulation and fall passage. We'll review that in a minute, right? Stomach infection, really rare. I only had one case, I think, with Romel. Um, difficult insertion, rare again. Hypoxia if the patient is not ready, right? And loss on airway death. The ones that also we are very are can be very frightening is the trachinominate arterial fistula, where basically I think we only have one case um, at Michigan so far that I'm aware, and um, the patient was able to survive after, but it was a nine-hour case that we were involved as well with our colleagues to vascular and thoracic surgery. Tracheoesophageal fistula is a late complication that can occur, for example, if the balloon is inflated. Uh, for a long time, or if during the dilation uh, and performing the procedure, you injure the posterior wall of the trachea, right? So when you are called, and again, this is uh, just principles that um, I want to share with you guys, especially for our fellows, when you are called for a tracheostomy, right? Um, the tracheostomy was already placed, right? And besides asking yourself who put it, who put the tracheostomy, right? Always ask yourself why, right? There are going to be, the, uh, and that's going to uh, tell you, right, if it's safe to change it, right, um, can I, can I, um, uh, why the patient has a tracheostomy? Because if a patient with a, a, a uh, sorry, ALS will be completely different managed if the patient is chronically ill, secondary to um, ICU um, weakness, or if the patient has severe pneumonia, or if the patient had a laryngectomy. So always ask yourself why. Take a look into the chart as the patient or as the family members. The second question that you have to ask yourself is also what type of tracheostomy? So uh, sometimes the chart is really bad, and we're going to emphasize about documenting really well, but what type of tracheostomy uh, the patient has currently and when was done? But just don't stay there, right? What the patient will need because um, <laughs> Because that, for example, will tell you if you need a cuff or cuffless, right? And if you are able to go into the chart and review if they have any problems putting the prior tracheostomy, great. If not, the majority of cases you will not have that. Um, super important is the upper airway patent, right? Um, we have several cases where um, the patient has had laryngectomies and nobody knew, or the patient had subglottic stenosis and the tracheostomy is lost and nobody can intubate from above. That, those are very, very important questions. And I have to thank our ENT and anesthesia colleagues at Michigan. We have a really good um, um, airway 
panel or airway signs and documentation that are always available in the uh, available in the chart and outside the bed of the patient, right? And uh, the other question, which is related a little bit more into when the tracheostomy was placed, right? Has the tracheostomy has previous has been previously changed, and if the fistula is well established, and that's why you have to look is to a surgical to a percutaneous, right? Uh, when it was placed, et cetera, right? Uh, let's just go through uh, quick pictures. This was a patient in, at, um, that we had, uh, was transferred from another place. Um, the length of the opening of the tracheostomy, this was an elective case. Uh, um, apparently when the patient arrived, was a, um, was a tracheostomy, this patient had COVID. Was just, uh, this is five centimeters length of opening, that's too much, right? Um, this patient um, was intubated after uh, from, uh, from above, right? Um, another tracheostomy complication, and that's why I always emphasize that um, I prefer, we prefer to have uh, our bronchoscopies who is guiding the tracheostomy to have a, a very minimum, some experience of how to handle the bronchoscope minimal suction to remain in the center because uh, this is what can happen, right? When, if you don't have good visualization, when you do the dilation, this will happen, right? Um, and that can be scary, right? The majority of these uh, lacerations of the posterior wall, don't worry, this, this didn't happen at Michigan, uh, right? Um, but we have some transfers. Like this, I think this video is coming from one of our colleagues of ENT who received a transfer. I can occur when we do the dilation or the insertion of uh, the punch dilator, right? Um, so again, and again, we appreciate a lot our colleagues in the ICU who help us to, to be the first bronchoscopy as well as um, be the second pair of hands in case that the patient um, requires a new intubation. Um, we're talking about the uh, uh, rupture of the posterior tracheal wall. And, and this is important just to remember when we're putting the blue rhino, which is this kind of horn, um, which is blue, it, this is actually a curved dilator. And um, when we're entering, for example, as you can see, this is a picture of um, one of the cases that I did when I was a fellow. Uh, we always have to have the visualization of the tip. And when we advance it, try to maintain it always in the axis of the lumen. So I always tell my fellows not to advance it, like if you were stabbing someone, not that I ever have to stab anyone, but um, it's preferred to hold it as, as a pen, right? And when you do the, sorry, when you do the dilation, you, is a movement of wrist in this position to ensure that the tip of the dilator goes Caudally and remains in the same axis of the tracheostomy. Don't don't hold it like that. Okay. Um, so early cartu uh, another um, er um, early complication is cart cartilage rupture, and this is quite common when you don't have good visualization and the needle and all the dilation goes through a cartilage, right? And you're gonna feel this when um, you're trying to dilate and you feel a lot of resistance, right? Um, these are actually are gonna lead to a secondary malaysia, an eight-shaped eight frame um, uh, malaysia in the future, right? And it's actually more common in older patients because and they tend to have calcified rings, right? And you go with a bigger dilator and you have more, you need to produce more force in order to dilate. Um, if you think that you have rupture of cartilage, right, it's preferably to do a bronchoscopic evaluation uh, from above, meaning through the larynx while you do the change to see if there is any uh, deformity in the future or any kind of granulation tissue or obstruction that you have to take care of, right? The ideal position when we do a tracheostomy, especially percutaneous one, is between the first, sorry, the second and third inter uh, cartilage space at 12 o'clock. Not at one o'clock, right? Not at 11, obviously not at three or nine, usually at 12 between second and third cartilage. And if you're a 
yeah, some people can put it between one first and second in, um, intercartilage space. This is quite common as well. Um, um, and just Victoria, to give you some uh, follow up on that patient, that patient basically had, I think, just um, we spoke about the bibonas, that they are so flexible that basically they're going to be hitting the posterior wall. And that's exactly what happened with a prior patient that Victoria took care, right? Um, as you can see, and that's why we always take a look at the end of the tracheostomy is to ensure that we are first above all above the carina, the menku carina, but also in the airway and center in the airway, we're not touching the posterior wall. This is a common reason having um, the opening of the tracheostomy again, the posterior wall, a common reason for high high pressures on the ventilator, inability to create, uh, sorry, inability to ventilate, inability to suction the tracheostomy, but also it can produce uh, granulation tissue obstruction and as well perforations, right? Uh, Bibonas, for example, again, I'm nothing against bibonas. I'm just um, transferring what I have read and experienced are actually more associated with a tracheotomic fistula than any other type of tracheostomies. So, um, how to avoid cough leak, right? So we're going to also um, see that um, we put the tracheostomy and hey, we have a lot of cough leak. The first one um, is because the tracheostomy might be too small for the airway, right? Just pay attention here. The cuff, the cuff is not. Now these tracheostomies called shiny flex are not round. They're actually a little bit kind of more ovoid. And um, in some cases, especially with the six tracheostomies, um, the tracheostomy is too big for the balloon, although the balloon can be completely inflated. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why after putting the tracheostomy, we inflate the balloon and we ask the bronchoscopies to remain within the endotracheal tube to confirm that the cuff is completely sealing well the airway, the, the airway right, of the trachea. Uh, the other one, and this is why I'm a little bit OCD of testing before putting the tracheostomy, there has been several cases where there is, there is a cuff leaks exactly in the balloon, but also in the pilot balloon, which is here. There is leak, and that's why we always check in water. You always see when we do tracheostomy, we have a bowl with water. Um, or if there is malposition of the tube, for example, if um, instead of being completely in the lumen, the balloon, instead of being in the lumen, the balloon is more proximal at the level of the stomach, you'll have leaks as well. Right? So, um, <clears throat> What to do when you lose the airway when the tracheostomy is dislodged, right? Don't worry if the patient is if the patient hasn't had any laryngectomy, right? And the um, it's a new tracheostomy within the first seven days, right? You have two options. If it's an emergency, patient can away, just intubate from above, right? And uh, you have enough time. We have um, repeated the tracheostomy the whole procedure itself on the same patient, but everything is controlled, right? We have, I think, two, two cases, sorry, and that those have occurred. If, uh, if, if it's beyond day number seven, right, I would say just use um, a bron bronchoscope or a sandy layer technique using the Weyman catheter that I show you, right? And you always have to confirm the placement before um, providing a positive pressure. I remember when I was a fellow in New York, um, in another hospital in Manhattan, somebody did a tracheostomy um, on the route to some guidance, skipping the, bron the bronchoscopic part. And basically the tip of the tracheostomy was placed in the esophagus and the patient was basically ventilated and uh, the patient died basically. That was a big lawsuit uh, in New York, right? Uh, in Manhattan. Um, bidet number four, right? You can, it's easier, the trick is better for, right? Um, just replace it at bedside, right? Using a quick exchange catheter that I show you, the Wayman catheter you'll have available in your in doubt, right? Request help, right? Use a bronchoscope if required. Um, if, for example, if you read that um, and you're aware that the patient is having um, subglottic stenosis, these are just type of things that 
we sometimes encounter this a picture of um, my personal collection uh, a patient with a very high tracheostomy uh, we went the patient was unable to phonate uh, we took him into the OR and this was a very fibrotic tissue right so the tracheostomy is behind this fibrotic wall we have to do a random boo uh, procedure in this patient um, and it was a joint procedure after we were able to cannulate after we couldn't pass a rigid through this right so the ENT went from the stomach from above sorry from below while I was directing with the uh, rigid bronchoscope from above he was basically following the light right um, another option if you are again in uh, in trouble you can actually put a, a number five and the trickle two with a cuff again to um, be able to ventilate but however I will say this is just a breach right obviously this is an emergency ensure that the cuff, the distal tip of the stoma of the sorry of the tracheostomy is not very distal right so you're not going to advance it up to 22 as you do in your um when you put your regular endotracheal tubes here you see here the stoma is just at the level sorry the balloon is at the level of the stoma right because if you advance it too much somebody who will be very excited will start bagging the patient or ventilate it uh, most likely the tracheostomy will be in the right main stem the patient will develop a PA arrest secondary to uh, a pneumothorax. So again, just be careful about the tip, right? And that's why when we do the cook exchange catheter, we always recommend to have it, uh, the cook catheter, when it's going through the stomach, not to go beyond 11 centimeters at the, lip, at the level of the skin, right? So uh, I'm gonna go a little bit faster with these ones. And uh, I think all the fellows have some cards are provided by um, the reps. If you need more, please check with Angela Sherman who can provide those. These are the most common uh, tracheostomies that we have at the University of Michigan. And super important is gonna, this label is gonna be, sorry, just let me put it here. Um, the, uh, these, the tracheostomies that we had two years ago was known as Shiley Legacy. Now we have the Shiley Flex. And, it can tell you the inner diameter, and this is important when you're gonna be bronchi, right? All the fellows already know all the outer diameters of our multiple scopes, but um, there is gonna be a stone labeling also on the right side of the plate. And this, the first number that you see here is gonna be basically related to the Jackson size. The second, uh, um, um, the second two letters are gonna tell you if it's cuff or uncuff, right? The, the numbers, which are gonna be the subsequent ones, are gonna be telling you what is the outer diameter of the tracheostomies, right? And as I said a couple of minutes ago, uh, the new Shiley flex are a little bit thinner compared to the prior ones that we used to use two, three years ago. And the last letter will tell you if the, will tell you if the inner cannula is reusable or disposable, right? The majority of us will be um, disposable, so we'll have an age, right? Um, super important as well is that the length of the tracheostomy is going to be correlating with the Jackson. So if you have a Jackson number eight, right, for example, here it will be longer than a Jackson number four or six, it's shorter. And that is important to remember when sometimes we change from a number eight, we go directly to number four. And you are called immediately after because the patient is unable to is able to breathe right but not not because he's breathing through the tracheostomy but right and the nurse can tells you right i cannot pass the suction catheter yeah it's most likely because again it's a smaller tracheostomy in terms of jackson number is shorter and most likely the tip has ended up already in the soft tissue right this is a good picture right that tells you again the sizes and the length of the um, the tracheostomy itself, right? All the fellows should have this card. I have it uh, next to my ID, right? Um, because sometimes can be confusing as well. So uh, this is another <laughs> another um, picture uh, shared by our ENT colleagues. Uh, thanks to Dr. Morrison for that. The patient with the tracheostomy, again, somebody who tried to help 
Uh, the patient was fine, don't worry. Uh, but the patient <laughs> had a small tracheostomy and they put the obturator of the tracheostomy in the stomach, right? The patient was fine, ENT came and they did, uh, they put the right tracheostomy in this patient. So, so when you lose the airway or you have an accidental decannulation, please select um, the proper the proper tracheostomy. And that that is meaning select the proper length are you going to use a regular shiny? Do you need an XLT proximal or distal, right? Um, uh, are you also going to need um, to brown that patient and therefore I need a little bit bigger one in order to pass a scope? And so all those things have to be running into your mind. Um, also, review how to secure the tracheostomy, right? Um, usually my own, my own tracheostomy is the initial ones. I suture them. Um, the, uh, ones that are all I don't suture, but I ensure that I speak with our our colleagues as well as our nurses on the floors, right? Of how to maintain well traction and also uh, prevent too much pressure uh, of the velcro on around the patient, right? We usually leave two fingers, right? And just also be aware that there are some type of patients who, no matter what you do, they are a higher risk of a tracheal dislodgement, and those are, for example, patients who have a very uh, particular um, anatomy, meaning those who are obese, um, they have soft tissue edema of the neck or they have a goiter, right? Or those patients who are on mechanical ventilation and are combative, right? So they are gonna mostly pull out, right? Uh, this is another example again about um, a very short um, tracheostomy with the teeth being dislodged, right? And then, they put a blindly a tracheostomy and the teeth in the uh, soft tissue. This can happen because, again, they selected incorrectly the type of tracheostomy, but also as uh, um, happened to last week as well, they, if you put too much additional padding, the horizontal length of thickness um, will increase too much and the tracheostomy teeth will not be able to open, to stay in the airway but in the soft tissue. In those cases, for example, we try to select, or it would be a better alternative to put a shyly XLT proximal, again, with the horizontal length um, a little bit uh, longer in order to bypass that soft tissue thickness. Uh, Tracheostomy novenate fistulas, common complication, especially as you can see here, right, when the balloon is hyperinflated, um, and this is a case, yeah. Patient did fine, don't worry. Um, but we had a case as well. So basically when the cuff is inflated too much, right? Um, and usually that's why, again, another teaching point is that we should have uh, that the cuff no above 25 millimeters of mercury. And our artists are super checking always this, right? Um, to avoid malaise in the future stenosis, or again, what can happen catastrophic. This was a patient that we we had at Michigan. She survived um, basically the calf. The, she had a vibona, again, placing another center in Texas. And the calf was super inflated and basically eroded into the airway, right? And for those cases, you should contact your thoracic surgeon, your vascular surgeon um, as well. And the things that you can do is, Hyperinflate the balloon, right, until everybody's ready. If you have the tracheostomy there, um, if the tracheostomy needs to be removed, put your finger and press anteriorly. Although I really tell you that most likely you will be putting your pinky, right, um, because usually the stomachs are not very big, right, and with the risk of actually occluding the whole airway. And what you really need to do in the meantime, and within this case, is just intubate orally with a bronchoscope, right? And have the balloon bypassing or compressing until everybody arrives. These are emergencies, right? Uh, and very few patients survive. Uh, late complications, um, as you can see here, granulation tissue, which could, could occur at the level of the stoma in the subglottic area or distal to the trachea. Usually patients are unable to, um, to phonate, you are unable to pass, um, the catheter suckling, et cetera, and in some of them will have bleeding, right? And you can see some examples here 
of subglottic tracheal stenosis that I have deal with here at Michigan. These are pictures of some patients that we did as well. And um, that's why we always take a picture at the end, right, of our tracheostomies. And super important, again, something that you will see a lot is patients coming with um, a tracheostomy but not using the humidification. Even when you use a passimal valve, please use humidification because the mucus will dry up and that can serve as a bowl um, of obstructing the airway and the patients die. Calf, super inflated, hyperinflated. You have a nice picture here in the sagittal view as well. And you have a tracheoesophageal fistula, right? No more than 25. This is a pulmonary board question, right? And our, your artist will always ask you, why 25? Because usually the vasculature perfusion is uh, on average 25 millimeters of mercury. So um, one day I was called from AD because somebody was cutting the, the ties of um, a catheter, I think, and they by accident, um, by accident they also cut the cuff, the pilot cuff of the tracheostomy. So in those cases, in case of emergency, yes, you can use a 20, 20 G uh, pink IV just to put it, but super helpful here. And again, this is available in a, all ADs and also in all our ICUs. We have a pilot tube kit. You can check in ICU how to do it, but I'm basically showing you here, cut, connect, inflate, and then <laughs> you'll ventilate the patient, but then you'll have to request to put a, a new tracheostomy, right? This is just a bridge for the patient to be able to be ventilated. Um, you will see also some mishaps, um, right? This tracheostomy, somebody can see here, is actually buried within the airway of the patient, right? So uh, that, that basically the plate of the tracheostomy um, was buried within the soft tissue, right? Um, so when assessing the correct timing of the, cannul of the cannulation, when they call you to decannulate the patient, again, these are questions for, or questions that every fellow should ask, right? Is as the indication for the tracheostomy result. If the patient has, for example, alternate status, is not able to control his secretions, et cetera, no, right? he's not ready yet, right? Does the patient, the other question is that the patient needs um, surgery, right? Is the patient gonna need any kind of requirement of um, positive pressure, right? Then if he's still gonna need required ventilator, right? Or his trajectory, right? During the, his hospitalization tells you, yeah, he's gonna need, he might, um, he might develop septic shock in the next couple of days, then there is no, no, no time to decannulate. Right? That the patient has appropriate mental status to control his equations, as we said. Right? And um, is the patient at least, um, is he ready to use a cuffless trach or not? Right? And if so, if you meet all these criteria, the patient is doing great, right? Doing passive mobile, et cetera. Yes, you can start capping trials, right? And I personally, although I think my ENT colleagues are a little bit more. Um, expeditious in terms of um, decannulating, I usually wait 24 hours before uh, removing the tracheostomy, right? And ensuring that the patient is fine. And 24 hours continues, right? If the patient had opened the tracheostomy at night, right? That is, is not a capping trial, right? And um, super important as well, I think we have this discussion with one of our fellows before. Um, the dressing doesn't matter after the cannulation. You can put I usually just put a four by four folded and then occluding the stomach. And I always ask the, the patient that every time that he's gonna phonate to put his finger here and able to not to have any leak. And the fistula usually will close within 24, um, 12 to 24 hours. And the majority of them will close within two weeks. I have had not so far in the last seven years as I'm attending any case of permanent um, tracheo cutaneous fistula. Um, I'm just going to skip this one, um, but super important that whenever you discharge a patient with a tracheostomy, please ensure that the family is well taught. There is a specific protocol that um, um, our prior AV director, and I think it's very well run by our um, managers in AV as well, or when the patient, and as well as the AVC team, they're very, they're super, of how to perform teaching. Our artists are super. Uh, uh, teaching our family members of how to do trade changes and the trade care, right? 
And just to summarize, again, um, when we talk about tracheostomies, this is not a benign intervention, right? Um, however, when we do tracheostomies, you have to be aware. You should, you should not be intimidated by this procedure, right? But if you put it, you own it, you know how to, you have to know how to uh, handle those complications uh, and manage it long-term, right? And the size of the tracheostomy is very important, right? And always examine, don't just rely on the chart, take a look, right, of what's going on. Uh, tracheostomy changes and downsizing can have complications. Anticipate, prepare, build your team, right? Always have a close airway cart, right? And an emergency plan. And um, I'm very grateful to all our super AD nurses who actually have been super helpful to um, when we do the cannulations or when we do high risk and tracheostomy changes in AD. I think that's the right place. Um, tracheostomies require daily care and require also a uh, care follow up plan and discharge. So once you own it, the patient is going home, please ensure that you or somebody from your team will be following up, right? And just again, it's about the team and that we're very, um, we're very lucky to be at Michigan where all our colleagues from surgery, ENT, thoracic surgery, the respiratory care and nursing are so thorough and, and careful with our patients. That's it. I'm ready for questions. Pepe, I put something in the chat, but you on your slide about dislodged uh, trach within seven days, you said intubate from above. Would you try bronchoscopically if you had quick access to, you know, in the, in the CCMU, we have the disposable bronch sort of ready to go. I've had some success just looking carefully. If you don't immediately see the trachea, obviously go from above, but would you give it a shot to go with bronchoscopic, like a Seldinger technique? Yeah, if the, I think it's a, it's a good question. Um, and it depends on the patient, of course, right? If you think that the patient is still ventilator or can have maybe 30 seconds of apnea, right? Um, and you have a disposable bronchoscope, like a thin bronchoscope to guide you, excellent, right? Uh, but if the patient is 15 of PIP, right, 90% uh, of FiO2, and you don't have room for error, I would say just intubate from above. Does it make sense? But if the patient is on PIP of five, he's doing fine, right, and PIP of five on FiO2 30, and you have a dislodgement, yeah, you can try the bronchoscope as long as you have it ready. Thank you. Thanks for your help with that case on AD, Pepe. Just to kind of clarify, people like the bivonas because they're longer and just easier to connect up to ventilators. Is that right? Uh, no. Uh, I think this, uh, that specific case, um, 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 they're able to customize it, right? And uh, it, it took us several weeks to do it. Um, I think it took two weeks. I'm bringing her back in two weeks, actually. That, that's a patient with um, uh, multiple tracheal surgeries in the past who developed, just to give a background to everyone, developed tracheal stenosis. And what we did is we put a wire stand and inside, and then we placed a bivona. Um, and then um, we brought her back. We removed the wire stand because the tracheostomy, the tracheal stenosis looked better. And Dr. Morrison, our EMT colleague, put the bivona back. What we noticed, um, there were two things basically. There was a lot of, apparently she was not, her tracheostomy was not very well humidified. And the other thing, so there was a lot of thick secretions, but also because, sorry, I'm not trying to be, to do any kind of a strip piece here. Um, they added extra pad, right, in the, in the trach pants. So that increased the length of the distance that the vibona has to, has to uh, uh, cover. And uh, basically, the tip of the vagona was hitting the posterior wall, right? So when we use just one pad, it was perfect in the center. If you added two pads, right, it was hitting the, 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 the posterior wall. And that, well, that was one of the issues. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, an interesting yes, bronch uh, with ENT uh, early in the morning. And uh, I have to thank that day to uh, Alexis and the whole group of APPs and, and also you, Victoria and John Howe, for expediting. We did a, 
kind of emergent uh, 7.30 when I have clinic at 8, um, Bronk and everything went well, right? So thank you all. And um, Rich, um, Rick, sorry, from AD is pointing there um, for everybody. Yes, uh, the Vibonas, the Vibonas TTS are inflated with water instead of air. Super important, okay? Any other questions? A DC Daisy Bronx Victoria. Yes, that is correct. All right. I'll see you all later. Okay. Thank you.